Let's get started. We, uh, we have Eli here. He will talk about, uh, you know, from shore to ship, you know, really exciting topic here. It's not about connected cars, it's about connected ships. So uh, take it away. Thank you. Okay, it's the switch that says on. Um, <laughs> all right, can you guys hear me now? Okay, there we go. Um, so thank, thank you guys for joining. Um, this has been a really interesting journey for like the last year of my life. So I'm Eli Sinavoy, I'm from Ernst & Young. You probably don't associate Ernst & Young with you know, this type of technology or technology at all. Um, it's something that we're working on and I'm personally uh, responsible for building. So I lead our microservices practice uh, where we essentially help any company out there. There's people that are obviously ahead of the curve in terms of looking at their monoliths and you know, breaking them apart into microservices and there are some that are laggards. And we really try to help across the line by bringing you know, our architects, our developers to speed up the process, coach um, your developers, your architects, your um, IT organization on what it takes to run microservices in production. And from there on, we you know, are there for advice, et cetera, as, as we take this on. So um, I'm actually presenting here on behalf of Royal Caribbean. They wanted to be here to co-present this with us, but uh, unfortunately, we cannot control the weather. And Hurricane Irma uh, was last weekend, and they've been stuck in uh, some DR activities. But um, you know, there's a silver lining because it's a really great use case to talk about in terms of what that has meant to us from the ability to do DR with microservices in production. I can actually tell you, talk you guys through a real live example of how that worked out for us. Um, so let me get started here. Um, so today when you go on a Royal Caribbean ship and you're trying to uh, sail anywhere, right, um, as a guest, you get those two pieces of paper on the screen there, right? It tells you everything that's going on on the ship today, like what type of activities are happening, where to go, what restaurants are out there, um, what menus they're serving, you know, what shore excursions are going on, which ports of call you're visiting, um, what's available on the shore once you get off the ship, things like that, right? Um, this two, piece, two pieces of paper get printed out every day and get placed in every guest's room, and it today costs about a million dollars uh, per ship per year to print out. So you can imagine that it's not the best way to do things, especially in the digital age. So there's no real good app uh, to go into um, in order to get the same information. And I don't know about you guys, I'm not carrying around a piece of paper with me when I'm on a cruise to figure out where to go, but I do have my phone on me, right? Um, and so this is probably my, my dongle HDMI doing a little flicker action. But um, at the end of the day, you know, the vision is to get this information on a phone and create a truly like, great experience for a mobile app for, for a cruise ship guest. Um, you know, when you try to do an initiative like that, you really want to start from scratch. But unfortunately, like, you know, for big enterprises, you know, a lot of the data is locked down by big mean mainframes and AS400s and all kinds of um, legacy systems that's really hard to get the data out of. And uh, I'm gonna talk you through some of the specific complications that, that um, we had to deal with. But um, at the end of the day, we thought that this was a really great example of truly releasing distributed systems because we had to put an application out there that worked on ships and on shore. So across a, a, a fleet of 40 ships, we had to have the same mobile application running that is running um, you know, today in production if you're on the shore um, over satellite connectivity, right, in the same way that you're not looking at your mobile app and saying, oh, this sucks, this won't load, I don't have connection, I don't have this, right? Um, so that, that was really the challenge that it, we were looking to solve. So um, I spoke a little bit about myself. The, these are the other guys that were supposed to be here with me. Laura Mao leads the software engineering team um, at Royal Caribbean, and then Roberto Aleman is one of our microservices developers um, that we've been working with. Been essentially a team of 
um, initially six developers onshore with about four off. Um, and since that beginning, we've actually grown to, um, from overall from a project perspective, from about 20 people on this project when it was just in the architecture phase to about uh, 200 plus now across different aspect of this app. So it's very rapidly growing. Um, it's getting not just into the mobile side of things, but also into um, ML and cognitive evaluation of some of the data you can collect from a cruise ship, as well as um, getting into web and, and other areas too. So it's, it's been very, very much um, over encompassing and the early successes obviously pave more of the road for uh, investing more and more into this so we can accomplish a lot of great things. Um, so classically as a consultant, I had to get this deck approved by our audit department so that I you know, don't say anything that I can't say and things like that. Um, and so I have to put like the consulting framework, the you know, complication, action, all resulting from some sort of a situation. Otherwise, they won't let me show it to you guys. So uh, this is what we're gonna be talking about today, but I won't spend too much time on this. Um, so let's jump straight into it. So the goal for the business was to release like a state-of-the-art mobile app, right? Um, and this app was supposed to be able to work ship and shore, no matter where you go, same type of experience, right? So in a sense, when you're opening your mobile app anywhere, and it's really hard to find, like some of the enablers that, uh, you know, you have companies like PubNub and, uh, you know, Elastic Beanstalk and, and some of these past solutions that let you do a lot of these things really easily in order to operate the same ship, the same thing over a hybrid architecture um, on both 40 ships and on shore in a way that doesn't require you to, um, you know, create different code bases and run it in a really simple way. Well, we really thought that you know microservices and Docker and um, DCOS was kind of our answer. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit um, how we got there and why we chose those things and what the drivers were. But the situation we were um, in is essentially you know a lot of really complex solutions have evolved on top of an AS400 solution, right? Uh, a uh, a cruise line is really dependent on their reservation system, right? So anything, it's like, the, it's like an ERP essentially for that type of operation. So any reservation that comes in, um, any type of accounting, any type of like B2B with travel agents or um, other uh, partners that direct people to the cruise line reservations, they all integrate into this one system. And the system is very old. Um, I'm sure you all have cases like that if you're in companies that have been around um, over you know, 10, 20 years that you have that, you know, one C system that holds all the secrets, right? That you, you have these grandiose plans of like one day we'll get rid of these things and you know, re-platform to something that gives us some more flexibility. But for now, we basically have to um, come up with ways to get data out of it. And for, our, for us, it's this reservation system. So it's AS400 base, it has some proprietary um, you know, version of DB2 behind it. Um, it's got an RPG service layer, which um, I'm 29 RPGs a little bit before even my time. Um, never even heard of it until these guys told me about it. <laughs> so on top of that, there's like a web sphere layer and another service layer and another service layer. It's a mess, right? Um, so how do we start untangling some of this stuff, right? Um, when you talk to some, some of the guys out here, you know, um, the Kafka guys like Kaufman and uh, Data Stacks guys, they'll essentially tell you that, you know, when you ingest all this information up, you can es essentially start recreating a lot of the systems, a lot of the data that you have, essentially in a cached layer above all the complexity, and begin using it as, as you please from there on. And, and that's something that we were trying to do in unlocking that issue. Um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, source of truth for content management and authoring. So in our situation, um, we, chose a system uh, in Adobe Experience Manager, but essentially a tool for people to take master data and then for the, the mobile app decorated with guest facing content, right? So you don't wanna see, you know, ship gross, gross tonnage of like this many tons and you know, this other master data detail, you want it uh, told in a more illustrative way, right? Like, welcome to Allure of the Seas, you know, this ship is beautiful and largest in the world, yada, 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 and you need a place to write all that copy and get it approved. So 
getting one place to do all of that, targeted at our product managers and our cruise directors was a part of this as well. Um, in terms of scalability and modernization, there was no existing service layer that could actually take on uh, the traffic that a mobile device could potentially um, mean, right? So today, when you're on a cruise ship and you want to go on a shore excursion or you want to buy a wine package or an internet package, you have to actually go to the guest services desk, stand in line, move a little bit more in line, move a little more in line, and then talk to a person that you know, will try to accommodate you and you, know, you sign up on a sheet. It's first come, first serve. You know, there's capacity, there's inventory for these things. Um, you know, it, from a millennial perspective, like, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a ridiculous expectation. If I can't do it from my phone, it's probably not gonna happen. Um, and so, um, also the potential of all the lost revenue that could come from people just able to book this stuff on their phone as opposed to people that get frustrated from waiting in line or not knowing that there is a line to go to, right, or just not knowing a, about a specific event or a feature of, or activity that's offered on the ship, you know, th that was kind of the, the thinking behind that. Um, and then for, from the perspective of what we wanted to build, you know, today if they wanted to make any change, it's a monolith, right? So, Everybody kind of has to put their kid gloves on and you know, talk to the database, database team and, and ask them like, okay, we want to use this table, we have to change this one aspect, like whoa, 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 like we're changing one value, like just a simple update to a row in a database, but kid gloves have to be on, everybody's prepared, it's like, um, you know, the analogy I use for it is, uh, we have these go, no-go sessions, right, where you make a decision. It's like electing a pope, so I call it the white smoke sessions. At the end of the session, you have some white smoke released, and we finally decide, okay, we've updated a row in a database, and good God, could that have been a whole lot easier if, um, you know, there was something that allowed us to update it without cascading issues across everything else, right? So. The microservices aspect helps us with that because we can actually divide things up. And um, if I forget to talk about this, remind me, but I actually can give you a, a situation that proves out the value of microservices over this hurricane, uh, which is essentially how we had a situation where we had unexpected logic happen in our app because all of a sudden a voyage had to be extended by four days and we had to go to a port that wasn't even a port that was in our database. Uh, because you know we were trying to stay away from you know people going into a hurricane, and um, had to essentially still reflect accurate information in the mobile app, um, and we did it really easily. I could literally go screen by screen in the app, field by field, because of my uh, ability to control each service in a fine-grained way to go and change that, um, and that is really really powerful. I don't know from a business perspective if you've ever had. You know, if you're a developer or a product owner and um, someone on the business side say, hey, we had to change this, and they really don't understand the cascading effects of what that change might mean in a monolith, and you had to kind of say, well, it's not that easy. It's, you know, it'll require X, Y, and Z. Um, this gives you an ability to build a product where you're essentially controlling how fine-grained you want your ability to be in the future to control some of these things. So it's really great from that perspective. Um, and then we wanted to make it resilient and scalable, right? Um, so, you know, today a ship is maybe 99% connected all the time. There's satellite connection, but for example, we cannot deploy a, um, a cluster that has nodes both on the ship and on the shore, right? That's, you're gonna lose that connectivity and that will, that will just throw too many errors. So that's not possible today because um, of you know, extended periods of disconnectivity sometimes. But it's not as big as people may think, right? Satellite is actually pretty strong. It's about a 300 megabit connection. Um, a good allocation of that goes towards the guest ability to use the, uh, the web, but uh, there's, you know, a QoS layer allocated for ship applications, and there's quite a bit of it, and the connectivity is usually good, but there are periods of blackouts. Sometimes you're in China, sometimes you're behind a mountain, sometimes you're Bermuda Triangle, you don't know, right? Um, so we do have to kind of plan for that scenario. Um, and then finally, um, I'm not sure 
if you guys have ever gone through um, the process of educating an organization that's been really running in a traditional IT mode about how to do DevOps, what DevOps is, what it means. Um, honestly, I've done this several times and usually they think they you know, just set up Jenkins and it just all starts going. Um, but you know, just to paint a, a scenario, if I wanna deploy a microservice today, first of all, this is an explanation that I have to make all the time. Usually people are just used to use DevOps for deploying code, right? But when I'm deploying a microservice, it includes, um, like in, in this situation, it was Legome code built um, on Java, right? Then we have um, our Kafka connectors. We have our Kafka topics that have to be created, either manually or by script or by turning on configuration. Um, then we have database schemas, database tables, and key spaces that have to be created for each table because we want to deploy our services in an immutable way, right? So we don't want any shared database pattern, and we want to uh, have a clean copy so that, um, you know, situations like actually one I have today, um, we had something funky happen um, to one of our services where the database table that it's relying on is corrupted in some way, and I can simply spin up another instance of it, redirect my API management to that new instance, take that on and down, and let the DBA team loose on it to figure out what happened. Um, so that's something that, that we needed to make sure we could do, but from a DevOps perspective, culturally has really been the toughest thing, because I have to, in order to make a tiny little change, I have to um, talk to, if it's, if it's across the whole stack, I have an infrastructure guy, which is separate from the cloud team guy, which is separate from the DBA guy, which is separate from the middleware guys that actually manage DCOS and Kafka, right? Um, and then we have a development team, and then I have the business side. So, you know, in order to make one tiny little change, that's eight different teams. And I don't know if you guys have been on uh, conference calls with like over 25 people trying to make consensus on something, but it's probably one of the worst things in the world. So that's, that's kind of day in and day out, right, of the situation we came into. Um, so we thought, like, we need to create a different vision. Like, we need to kind of let loose on it. So our vision was to create kind of one digital hub, one uh, footprint or reference architecture of what Royal Caribbean's future architecture would run on. So, um, you know, there's obviously still kind of struggles with this, but the idea is any new application, any new service would be deployed along with these microservice principles. It would be deployed on DCOS. Um, it would use NoSQL and Cassandra in some cases, depending on which, you know, we, we, we sometimes would use, um, you know, some sort of a relational database as well, but um, in most situations, it would adhere to this kind of footprint that I'm about to share with you in a few more slides, right? But um, everything that is to this date kind of the traditional integration type services, so um, enter enterprise service buses, any um, type of that older, you know, XML SOAP based type of integration technology, et cetera, um, we're gonna go away from that and leave it to um, the things that are simple, don't change too often, don't need to be a microservice, et cetera. Um, I don't have a slide for this here, but uh, there is a slide that I share with my clients that it's essentially uh, a matrix that says, are you a microservice? And it essentially splits it across um, the speed of change from a business perspective and the complexity of management, right? If it's complex to manage and it doesn't change too often, you don't need to make it a microservice because it doesn't change too often, it's already set up, and you're probably gonna just trade off for more complexity to manage that one thing that doesn't really need that level of complexity. But if it's something that changes every few days, a lot of requirements, you really need that fine-grained ability, um, and it has some level of complexity to it, then you know, by all means, you need the tools that microservices gives you in order to manage that, but you also need to set up the kind of the uh, enablers around it to be able to manage that complexity as well. So things like, you know, circuit breakers and service catalogs and uh, service discovery, um, you know, uh, ability to do green-blue deployments and uh, canary deployments, um, all those types of things are enablers to essentially manage microservices at scale that 
you need to have if you're going to be uh, building them, right? So that was kind of the goal there. Um, and then the next part of it was essentially getting everybody on the same page, right? From an organization that was really living in the SOA world around um, ESBs and things like that, just getting everybody on the page that, okay, our ESB is no longer the main place. We're going to use in ESB in places where we don't want to be in the business of building integrations. We don't want to build new connectors. We want to use easy, simple connectors for things uh, because there is no competitive advantage in building it. There is no reason to. It's already available in our ESB and it's simple. That's when we can use that traditional integration technology. But for everything else where it gives us a competitive advantage to build something new, something that brings logic that um, no one can compete with us on, right, that essentially makes us better than our competitors, that makes sense to, for us to own that code, for us to customize and maintain it long time, um, you know, in time forward. So, um, obviously, it isn't a smooth road, so the next slide is comp complications. So, we try to answer these three questions. Um, you know, how do we deliver with what we have today, and what else do we need? So, um, when I look at, I, I actually came into the whole microservices, native cloud world from uh, doing a lot of IT strategy work. And I used to do a lot of application um, maturity assessment and rationalization assessments, which um, they're essentially a way to take your CMDB if you have one. If not, it's a, a nice Excel spreadsheet exercise, but you take your application inventory and gather a bunch of survey information from both business quality and technical quality of your application to help you determine one of four things. Is that application um, redundant, not in the good way, redundant as in it's duplicative, um, and you need to essentially retire it? Or um, do you need to either replatform it, enhance it, or completely replace it, right? So one of those four things you can figure out through that. So we essentially did a similar assessment here to say, you know, we need these things for us to be able to run microservices. And this is what we have here today, and th these are the gaps. And we need to bring in some new technology in. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we have a standard ship shore footprint. So um, this is one of the key reasons we chose Mesosphere. Um, but in general, when we were doing our assessment, we were choosing between um, Pivotal and OpenShift and DCOS uh, in terms of how do we orchestrate containers and scale. And when we were doing that assessment, one of the key things that we were focused on is, you know, we cannot run a cloud on our ships. We have, we're constrained on space. Um, we don't have the skill set. You know, we have RIT um, on the ships are, are folks that are basically guys that, you know, are sysadmin level and below that um, are committing six-month contracts to work IT on a ship, right? We, we're not sourcing, um, you know, the next brightest engineers and Google and Apple and, you know, all the places where some of that talent goes. So we had to come up with something that was easy to, to work, but also allowed us to deploy, uh, to deploy the same code, ship or show, no, no matter what it is. So we needed the same experience from uh, the infrastructure layer up for everybody. And DCOS, uh, which we ended up with, gave us that. But the other solutions did as well, right? Same interface, one CLI or one UI to go into um, one way to essentially configure your services and deploy them, whether you're on ship or on shore. Like to us, we don't care what it's running on. We can SSH into either one. We can, um, you know, type in an IP and we get onto it and see the same thing whether we are on ship or on shore. So that was really important. And then the final thing is just keeping ship and shore in sync, which um, is probably the toughest mission. We still have a few patterns we're perfecting. Um, but, you know, Kafka and solutions like that were really important for us on that front. So what we were really trying to achieve is, first of all, that we have the same data ship and shore. But then we had the additional complexity of some systems exist on the shore and some systems only exist on the ship. And some data um, falls into um, essentially the realm of it goes to the ship and never makes it off of it. It goes on the ship, gets manipulated on ship, comes off the ship, and then we have to analyze it. It originates on the ship, 
comes off or it originates and it doesn't get off the ship, right? So for each of those scenarios, while that data is still live and isn't retired, we had to think about, you know, if we're using it in the mobile app, it still needs to be on the shore and we have to give it the same uh, time to live as what it would have on the ship originally and vice versa with the shore data. And how do we arrange all that so it's not a mess to manage, right? And if we're doing it in a microservices way, we can't share it really. We have to essentially create immutable versions of it that are specific for each functionality. We have to really do some, some really um, selective domain modeling on you know, how to make this really cohesive and how to make it really decoupled in a way that won't be an absolute nightmare to manage. So this is the kind of assessment that we looked at. So from an EY perspective, this is our uh, map of all the different areas in middleware or integration, right? And, and I can understand how, in a way, not everybody thinks of this field or this area in the terms of middleware. I actually think it's a pretty bad term as well. But in, in that specific case, it was, um, you know, they were called the middleware group. So they were owning it and we were using terms to um, essentially resonate with folks. But all the green stuff was essentially all the traditional integration tools that you would typically have, right? Very so and ESB centered. Um, and then the red stuff are a lot of things that you probably would have um, in running microservices. You can obviously see there's a lot more red than green because um, it requires a whole lot more components. Just the smack stack itself is five things. And, <laughs> and there's obviously a whole lot more running in there, right? Um, and then there's a lot of you know, governance, a lot of uh, little aspects that, that often get missed out. So um, we essentially try to come up with what solutions do we need to bring in that helps us cover as many areas in this as we can in the least amount of time, right? Um, and also with the least amount of money and probably we don't want a solution per each of the boxes, right? We really tried to optimize it as much as we could. Um, so the other aspect of it is, you know, we're trying to explain to people why microservices, right? Um, it's a, quite an education for a lot of folks that don't understand the term, especially if you're talking to someone on the business side, which, you know, most of the time they're the guys that are going to fund your project. Um, and you have to explain to them what they're going to get out of it. Um, so this was my attempt at it, which, um, there we go, oh. <laughs> um, which, which was around explaining, you know, the aspects of agility, scalability, resiliency, and those things. So like going one by one, right? Um, fine grain functionality and quicker release times. So I can little. I'm going to use the the example that I that I had with the hurricane. It's probably a good way to apply it. So um, we had a situation where. Um, our voyage because of Hurricane Irma, uh, there are two voyages, one September 3rd and one September 10th. The September 3rd one got extended from seven days, which is the typical duration, to 10 days. And the September uh, 10th one now was four days and began on September 13th, which is when the September 3rd one now ended. So one got extended by three days and one got shortened by three days, right? Um, that is not a typical behavior that we ex expect from our, our voyages. And so the way that we had built um, some of this, it had to be able to be flexible enough that when we haven't built the logic to change some of these aspects, we weren't showing guests wrong information in the mobile app, right? Um, and, and we were still honoring some of our product tenants, which one of them is the accuracy of information in that app. And so, um, the fine grain aspect is really nice because in that situation specifically, we have um, a voyage picker screen on the app. Um, by the way, if you guys want to look at it live, uh, the app that's running um, on DCOS, if you look up Royal Caribbean International in the iOS app or Google Play Store, it's right there. Um, you know, go on it, leave a review. If it sucks, it sucks. If it's great, it's great. <laughs> um, the service layer underneath it is what's built on DCOS and, um, you know, using some of the uh, principles here as well as the team um, that, that we did this with. Um, I happen to think that it looks pretty slick and it's working really great. Um, so in terms of 
the quick release times, et cetera, right? I was able to go individually to the service that, you know, the main page, which is our voyage picker that lets you select which voyage you're on and individually manipulate just that page without affecting anything else with the complete confidence that my app will stand up, that no other page would be impacted, right? That um, the app wouldn't go down just because of that. And I would specifically, if I stayed true to the API contract, right, between the mobile and the microservice, that everything will be just time. And that confidence is really great because even though we have these white smoke sessions, right, with the go, no go, I'm sitting there being like, okay, just tell me when, right? I can deploy this really easily. Um, even though I have to answer like, what's the impact of, you know, if we do this change, et cetera, I can basically always answer with, well, it's really isolated. The only thing impacted is gonna be this label, or this piece of text, and it gets manipulated by this piece of JSON and my API, right? It doesn't impact anything else because that's running in a completely separate container and a completely different service. So there's no impact downstream. They don't share a database. They don't share anything. They're completely immutable. I could launch three more. If we want to take that one down and you want to dissect it and look at it under a magnifying glass, you can. I just need to you know, route the traffic over and we can do it in production if you want to because the app is only going against this one service and it's isolated, right? Um, in terms of the downtime, what's really great about it is kind of the aspect I just talked about. You know, uh, there's really zero downtime with the rolling deployments that we do. Um, we typically do things uh, more prescriptive than just using kind of the, the restart or deploy option within DCOS. Um, so if you've played around with some of the options uh, for zero downtime deployment that, that come with Marathon LB, but um, my preferred way of doing it is actually, uh, I'll call it kind of the vamp way or the canary release way, which is essentially um, spinning up an instance on its own that's nice and good, doesn't even have to be in the same pod, can have a different name. It has its own IP or its own service discovery, um, DNS, whatever it is. Rerouting uh, my, tr my actual live traffic to it and then the old instance I can take down. It's a rolling deployment, but it's a little bit more prescriptive um, as opposed to Mesos can handle it, right? Like I can just do it all in DCOS, have it uh, based on my upgrade strategy. I can set up kind of the minimum amount of live ones and non-live ones, et cetera. But specifically at Royal, this has been more effective because I can show people right, that the traffic's being routed here. You have nothing to worry about on the other side. Um, when you do some of the more mass deployments, like some of the guys I've spoken out here to and like GE and Verizon where they have, uh, their clusters are just huge and they're running way more workloads than we are, the automation probably makes more sense, right? But for a lot of these things, it's about the comfort level as well and getting that comfort level with some of these technologies for folks, you know, as they're very new and they're coming onto it, it's import, important to, um, do it in the right way. Okay. So um, I'm gonna blaze through this slide because I'm talking a little bit more than I usually would have. I think it's just a nervousness. Um, but we essentially ended up with two footprints, right? This is just a simplification. But um, to solve the first portion of it, of the uh, same footprint, ship and shore, we essentially run the same exact thing, ship and shore. It's really as simple as that, right? We have underneath here vSphere and underneath here EC2s on AWS, right? And from there, it's really DCOS and up. We run Cassandra, we run Kafka. Um, and from there, um, you know, we, we do our API management through Apigee. And that's, that's essentially our structure. Um, the nice thing about that um, is it's exactly the same ship and shore, same folder structure, same service names. I can take my Jenkins and Jenkins actually does a deployment to my Clyde DCOS and, um, and our, our Jenkins actually lives in a completely separate like DCOS environment, it's in our dev environment and he can go deploy to any environment I want to because it's also centrally connected to our secret store and it has everything it needs to know and all the permission that it needs to go put our code and all the other stuff that goes along with it and other clusters, which is really, really convenient. Um, and then 
we have the Confluent uh, aspect in between, right? So um, we do use Confluent Kafka to to power things up, um, and you know, it's I think it's been really great working with them on, on that solution, but. Um, one of the really great pieces that comes with kind of the enterprise Confluent ver uh, version is the replicator, right? Um, which, you know, the traditional like mirror maker that comes from the, just the Apache project, it doesn't do enough to, um, to really get you the capabilities that this does, which essentially, you know, if you've played around with Kafka Connect, it lets you just create a really simple and easy connector that makes sure that you're replicating topic to topic across two Kafka clusters. Right, like usually you have your sync and source that are some sort of, you know, one of them is Kafka and something else is like a DB or, you know, a, a search engine like Elasticsearch or something like that. In this situation, it's Kafka to Kafka and it's really great. Um, I mean, I could even have a case where I'm essentially doing um, a replication of like duplicating a topic by writing, like, you know, using the replicator into my cluster as well to create two, so it's really great. Um, to have that flexibility for replication. All right, so overall, um, from, from our stack perspective here, this was what we started out with. Um, I could say that out of all of the things on here that, uh, that we use, you know, it's been really great uh, writing things in Legome, especially if you have developers that have never written microservices and are, you know, career Java Spring developers or just, um, you know, are really new to microservices. Um, our guys were uh, Java devs for a long time. Um, we chose Legome because it's a very opinionated framework on building microservices. So it really, you know, if you're concerned that your developers have kind of a cowboy mentality and can go build things like, you know, a hundred different ways, which I love developers, that's one of the best and worst things about them. Um, I think that's something that helps you kind of harness that and, and, and from an architect perspective, as someone overseeing this, it gives me a lot of peace of mind that they're building it in the right way. Um, you know, we run things on RHEL, um, you know, Docker runtime, which we may or may not switch to um, the universal runtime sometime soon. Um, in terms of service discovery, we, did, we do a lot of the in-cluster service discovery specifically for actual like at addressing between services using the built-in capabilities with Marathon and kind of Marathon DNS, et cetera. But we actually found that using console for cross-cluster service discovery is really useful. So console gives us a opportunity to do service discovery across all the ships in one single pane of glass, right? So I can install a console agent on every ship and they all talk to each other using a gossip protocol that allows me to view every service that I have running across a ship of 40, uh, a fleet of 40 ships, right? So it's, it's a really great way for me from a monitoring perspective to go to one single pane of glass and see every service in every cluster that's running, how healthy it is and there's even opportunities to send metadata and things like that um, into console to, to display as well along with it. So that, that's really been great. Um, in terms of dynamic property management, you know, this is an interesting area. We try to um, do a lot of kind of the Netflix OSS things around um, like hot reload configuration and stuff like that so that we could, um, you know, essentially change configuration without having to restart the service. And there's a lot of really great solutions out there. I can't really get into the specifics, but um, we do our config management in console as well because it provides you the key value store. And our microservices, essentially each one of them is connected to console and is essentially watching it for changes relating to itself. And if we wanna, for example, turn on um, like debug, for example, to go from info to a more verbose uh, logging level, we can do it in console without restarting the service, which is uh, really nice. And it gives us other capabilities if we wanna change anything else within it. But it really gives you a lot of flexibility and really changes the game in terms of zero downtime. Like I don't even have to think about a rolling deployment. I can literally go change a cell in a KV store and the service would pick it up. Um, in terms of circuit breakers, we used kind of the built-in circuit breakers in Legome. Um, we are working on a way to essentially instrument that using Turbine and Hysterix, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and I'm, I'm getting booted here, but <laughs> um, do I have time for questions? Okay, sounds good. 
I'll just leave you guys here with just this slide so you can see a picture of the mobile app if you haven't downloaded it. But um, let's open up for questions. Um, in which? Between ship and oh, between ship and shore. Um, so honestly, the way that we have our network running, um, it's, it's really just another, the ship network essentially extends into our data center, right? And um, for us, it's just another IP. So uh, the way that we've been dealing with it, uh, we have done some troubleshooting in terms of latency and things like that, but um, just to eliminate things along the way, right? There's just probably, an inordinate amount of um, like load balancers and proxies along the way that you kind of have to deal with. So we have done quite, like one of the biggest pain points have been opening the right firewall ports to, um, to essentially get this thing flowing. But once we did and kind of templatized it a little bit, now we're able to take it from, from ship to ship. Um, and then one of the things we're uh, looking into but struggling a little bit um, is configuring the right uh, polling interval for, for some of the um, Kafka replication that, that we're doing. Um, but we're getting better and better at it, right? I think we started with um, like every 24 hours for some of our things and we've knocked it down to, um, you know, for some of our more fragile, most of them are real time. Our more fragile systems are down to, you know, two hour updates, which really happy about. That's from, a, you know, from our AS400. But, Everything else that's just purely running on here, like our weather service, um, our ship statistics, things like that, that's real time across ship and shore. Oh yeah, I, I personally was not doing that, but yes, we've had so many headaches. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, so uh, it's, it, you probably want to segment it a little bit, right? So there is data that is only um, relevant to a voyage, right? Um, and then there's data that's a little longer lived. So we have things like, um, there's even things that are only specific to a day of a voyage, right? So today we show things like the current weather, sunrise, sunset, um, when the, the gangway and the ports open and close, that's probably for that specific day, right? Then we have things like the activities for the whole voyage and which day they happen on, what products are there, et cetera. And that gets set up by our content team for each voyage. Uh, it's, that's gonna get more complicated as we start doing that on 40 ships. Right now we're only on one, right? So that process itself will, will get very complicated. Then we have very long lived data, right? Um, our list of ships, our list of ports, um, the itineraries that each ship take, for example, the Allure goes Eastern Caribbean and Western Caribbean. It alternates every, um, every week. It always leaves on Sunday, always comes back on a Sunday. Some of that stuff doesn't change very often unless there's a hurricane. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, everybody.